recording. All right, so here we go. We're good to go. We're all set and ready to go. Everybody is good? Yes, sir. Good. How about yourself? I am much better because uh, of my daughter uh, reports that she is uh, on the mend uh, two days without a fever, or as she said to me, explained, I'm healed. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good. That mm -hmm. makes me feel good and uh, actually took away a lot of rage that I had yeah. been feeling. Uh, so I'm, I'm also grateful, you know, not just for her health, but grateful that I have, uh, the rage has subsided. And Zane that, never uh, showed any symptoms? Excuse me? Zane never had a temperature or anything? Oh, no, no. Zane was sick. Yes. Zane, Zane he was, was Yes. Oh. Th which further added to the rage, you know, a one-year-old oh. child yeah. uh, dealing with this, my grandson. You know, um, yeah. so, uh, but uh, he's, he's good. Uh, he's back to his normal uh, fat, chatty self. So, <laughs> That's good. praise good. God for fat grandchildren, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Fat, happy grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, with that, uh, can someone open us up in prayer, please? Okay. Dear Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come to you today just thanking you and praising you for all your all your works that you have done for us, for healing Alex and, and Zane, <clears throat> and for all the other COVID victims that you are healing today. I just ask that you be with each and every one of us today and give us the understanding of what you having your messenger give to us. I ask these things and more in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Okay. So uh, thank you, Lord, uh, that we are here to see another day and another week. So we have been in Daniel. And uh, boy, I tell you, this just keeps the more I, I study and prepare uh, for this, the uh, more it just uh, amazes me on uh, what exactly what we're dealing with uh, as far as what God is revealing. We had gotten into uh, chapter eight of Daniel and this new dream uh, that he has of a, uh, uh, as, as it is titled, the vision of the ram and a goat. Uh, so we, we <laughs> came across that where Daniel identified where he was uh, and we pointed out last week some of the, the historical uh, and other biblical references to where Daniel is talking about where he's from, uh, as far as he as he says in the ver in the verse two of chapter eight, I saw in the vision, and so it happened while I was looking uh, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, Elam, and uh, we saw uh, from the scripture in uh, Nehemiah uh, that Nehemiah, when he was serving King Artaxerxes. He was in Shushan, uh, the citadel. Uh, and so it's these, I, I stress it again um, for the main purpose is that we realize that the biblical narrative is woven together. This, this letter, this a love letter from God to us is a integrated communication to us. There, there is none of this idea that uh, atheists like to put out that that it's uh, contradictory. This this is a synthesized, integrated communication system, and it it's only can be um, uh, co found contradictions when you are looking for contradictions and purposely take things out of context and pit them one against the other, uh, which you can do with anything find a contradiction in it if you sit there with the mission of picking and choosing bits and pieces and putting it together instead of looking at the whole thing in its totality. Uh, but that's a whole nother thing. But we see here in Daniel, he's, he's having another vision. Uh, and he, he specifically says this is in the third year of King Belshazzar. So this is, you know, he, this is going back in time from when King Belshazzar was king. He's now re, re 
relaying to the story, I guess, from his memory of what happened uh, with Bill Sharzar or the dream he had. And the um, what I look at or what strikes me with this is that Daniel, the interpreter of dreams, is now having dreams that he can't interpret. He, this dream in particular, he it, it bothers him. And he, he talks about this dream and he talks about this ram and how the ram uh, was there and, and nothing could, could stop the ram. He, everybody that came into his, pa his path, he was able to overcome until a goat came. And then the goat <clears throat> overtook the ram and the goat became strong. And this idea and the vision of these, these horns on the ram and the horns on the goat and what these ram, the horns represent. And he, he's dealing with all this imagery. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it was dealing with this, uh, this beast that was devouring everything. And now he's dealing with rams that were able to uh, take on anything to come in their path. And, and he's, then the goat who's able to overtake the ram is just all this stuff is just going on and on and on. And he's having these dreams and visions, and it obviously means something, but it's something that he can't figure out what it exactly means. Um, some, some people have said, you know, they, they've had some pretty strange dreams. Other people said they don't ever remember having any strange dreams. And just recently, I had a dream that I sat there, and even after I said here on Bible study, I'm going to start keeping a notebook by my bed so I can write down my dreams. And I didn't do it and woke up with this crazy dream that I didn't write down. Uh, but it was a really another case of just as you wake up and you got this crazy dream and you're trying to think, what does this mean? And if you write it down, maybe you'd be able to recall it or have some understanding of it later. But clearly here's Daniel had a remembrance and could remember his dream and what was going on. And it was just very bizarre to him. Uh, and let's, let's start off at verse eight uh, uh, today, uh, even though I think we had... Uh, gotten past that if i'm not mistaken yeah we had passed this this portion uh, but you know what let's go to 13 we'll start at verse 13 it says uh so daniel after he he's talking about these uh no let's go ahead and do verse eight verse eight it says therefore the goat grew very great but when he became strong the large horn was broken and in its place Four notable ones came up towards the four winds of heaven, and out of one came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. Uh, and if you recall last week when we talked about this, this little piece of, of the sect or this section of the scripture, he's envisioning having a vision of this goat where the horn actually went up to heaven and pulled part of heaven and stars down and trampled it. Now we know in, in the literal sense, this is not happening, but your dreams are not always going to be literal. They're going to be some kind of symbolism in them. That's why they become so confusing, but it's easy to see that when he's re referring to this dream, he's dealing with someone who is uh, well, someone or a group of people who, who believes that they are greater than God and so much so that they believe they have this much power that they can go up and pull down heaven and the stars and trample them on the ground. I mean, this is a, what you're talking about, people who are, are pompous. Uh, and, uh, or as it said, in this case, four notable horns came from one, um, I mean, out of, in its place, four notable ones came up toward the four winds and one came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great. I mean, it's, this is what you're seeing these people who grow up or, or not become not grow up, but grow in power and influence and their heads become exceedingly large uh, because they believe that they are greater than what they actually are. Uh, and it says that in verse 11, he exalted himself as high as the prince of, <laughs> of the host and by the daily sacrifices were taken away in the place his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. 
And so if we see this, the truth means nothing in the case of this particular animal. This horn uh, grew so strong and so great uh, that he and amassed an army. Uh, it says he was given, opposed the daily sacrifices and he cast truth down to the ground. And he did all this. Essentially, we're talking about a liar. Truth means nothing to a liar. And this person grew in power because they gave way to lies. The, the, as I said to you guys before, someone had really thought that I should do this Bible study, uh, mainly because it looked eerily similar to a current leader of a nation who does not value truth. And we see that because of transgression, an army, which he has, was given over to the horn to oppose daily sacrifices, which he has not done yet, but this is what he has done, cast down truth to the ground. And in all of his lies, he prospered, which is what we see. Then in verse 13, then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to the certain one that was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? How long? And you think about that in our current times, we, we have conversations with ourselves and we watch the political landscape and we'd say, how long is this going to keep going on? How, how long? We, we heard it when on the day before Memorial Day when George Floyd was murdered. How long are we going to still have to, to deal with black men being killed in the streets? How long? How long are we going to deal with uh, this man in the White House that just continually raped this nation? How long? How long do we have to deal with these people and not just him, all of those in the political offices that are enriching themselves at the expense of, of us uh, working together and against us? How long are we going to continue to stand for that? How long are we going to continue to watch church after church after church uh, build themselves up mighty empires and continually to hide pedophiles and sex offenders? I, I just read a story today about a church uh, in the Bay Area uh, that uh, a le it leaked out that the pastor of this 6,000 member church had a son that is an admitted pedophile in charge of youth ministry. Now he claims he's never acted on his impulse to uh, be with young people, but how irresponsible is this? How, how is it that you go to a pastor of the church who happens to be your father and say that you have a proclivity to, towards children and he puts you in charge of children. Now see, I, I, while I may feel that a lot of this has, could be pointed towards a particular uh, man in power, I also look at this as being pointed towards us as people, as collectively, as a group of believers, how long are we going to allow all of these little horns to grow in power and influence? And, uh, or he says, uh, concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation. How long are we going to allow these people to desecrate, desolate, uh, or be, uh, in, indulge in transgression of desolation of our faith? And in verse 14, he said to me, for 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. What do you think that means, the sanctuary will be cleansed? They're going to get rid of all the evil. What does that kind of mean for us? Gonna clean up this think, earth. Yeah, rid <laughs> the evil in our lives. Yeah. I'm going to John chapter two. Uh, this is a famous story. John chapter two, verse thirteen. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found the temple, those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. 
when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temples with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold us, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered what was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Uh, but you see, the, they, we call this incident that Jesus cleanses the temple. And, and we look at how he comes in. He comes into his father's house, the place that's supposed to be a house of prayer. And he finds those who, who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. Isn't it interesting that when you read this and nobody ever looks at the fact that he's saying they're doing business in the church and how the church is literally doing business today? I mean, it really is a business. Anytime you can go to a church and plop down uh, 10 million and build a sanctuary, $10 million to build a sanctuary. You doing business, right? But when he cleanses the temple, the first thing he does is make a whip of cords. He's coming in inflicting pain on those who disrupt or defame his father's house. He made a whip of cords and he drove them all out of the temple. And then we see what he says here, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. I should have done the math on this to see what, you know, how many, uh, I mean, it's obviously not a whole lot of years, because, but it's still just kind of wondering. <laughs> I did. It is 300. Oh, wait. Yeah, it's 300 and it's 326 years. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's seven, seven weeks, seven days in a year. So I did the two, 2,300 divided by seven, seven weeks in a year. No, no, no. Seven days in a week. In a week. Yeah. So I divided seven into 2,300. Mm, also, as to how many right. weeks, yeah. So how many okay, weeks so is that? 326 or 20 something. I closed it out. I didn't know you were going to say that. I was just doing it for my own information. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. roughly about six years. So you just kind of mm -hmm. wonder when this was uh, was going on here. But, you know, you see what he, I mean, he's obviously means serious business. That and after this period of time, the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. And, and so here... Could it be, because we are dealing with a dream and we are dealing with Daniel, that the sanctuary is not necessarily the house of God, but could be the planet Earth? Hmm. I mean, this is, we say, uh, and you all, everybody who's not AME, you know, when we have our call to worship, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Silent, not silence. Let all the earth be silent before him. But we know God is not just stuck in a building we build. If, if we gather together, when Jesus said, where two or more gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst of them, uh, kind of tells us the sanctuary is in our houses. Sanctuary can be at a restaurant. Uh, sanctuary can be where we are, where two or more gathered in, our, in his name, he will be in the midst of it. Or we can just look at it that where we, are, we got bodies of people, especially now in this COVID mess, where we literally got people gathered, two or three gathered all the time. Right now, two or three gathered all the time. And so we are sitting when God says that this after this period of time, I'm cleansing the temple. It may not just be churches, probably not going to be churches. But remember, when he cleansed the temple, it started with a whip of cords. Verse 15 in John uh, uh, 2, John chapter 2, verse 15, when he had made a whip of cords. Now, we like to joke and talk about people getting the butt whooping but you want to get your butt whooped by Jesus? 
a whip of cords by Jesus coming to, to cleanse the temple. Drive, can you imagine it driving you out of your house because of the way you behave? Then he gets into verse 15. Then it happened when, Dan, when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning that suddenly three stood before me, one having the appearance of a man, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ule, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Not now, the end. Is he calming Daniel down? Say, hey, you know, I, I realize what you're seeing has got you confused and got you concerned, but this is not happening now. This is for later. Verse 18, now as I was speaking with him, while, no, while he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and stood me upright. Then he said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the later time of the indignation for at an appointed time, the end shall be. The end is going to come. I'm showing you the vision. I'm explaining the vision. But he doesn't just refer to the end of the time. The later time of the indignation. Is God so disgusted with us and our behavior as believers that he refers to this time or whatever time that is, just the indignation? Do, do you ever think about how you act or how you behave that your life would be considered uh, or that God would look at you as say you are indignant? You are an indignant individual, Ronald Thomas. Yeah, what, what do you mean me? I, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm nice to people. I care about people. We are so consumed and caught up with being good. We'd rather be good than righteous. Being good doesn't always require anything of us. We can be good to people. It, what, what harm is it for us to go down to the store once a month and spend 20 bucks on food we would never eat and give it to homeless people? We're good people, right? They wouldn't have had anything to eat, but I bought them a cup of noodles. I bought them top ramen. Got them some macaroni and craft macaroni and cheese. They wouldn't have had that without me. We're good. 20 bucks didn't cost you anything. 100 bucks don't cost you anything. We blow 100 bucks in a day like that. Let somebody celebrate, graduate from, from middle school, high school, college. How much money are we spending on that celebration? Easily drop $1,000 at a family dinner without even blinking. Mm -mm. <laughs> Just whip out that plastic and put it on there. I'll pay it later. Mm -mm. But what does it cost to be righteous? See, we, we think because we have done so good that we're not, uh, I'm good. You know, come on, guy. I mean, I did this. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind to people. I, hey, that guy at the end of the freeway, I gave him five bucks on Tuesday. But he said at the end of indignation, something is going on with the people of God. We are not doing what God has called us to do. We are not, we haven't become what God has called us to be. We haven't transformed into those beings that God wants us to be but we're caught up in being good. Was somebody about to say something? Mm -mm. But being good means nothing? 
it's it's not that it means nothing, but I mean, it's it's uh, uh, Deborah, you could help me out on this and find that scripture. But the uh, this is one scripture when he uh, he talks about um, uh, goodness gracious. I I forgot how it goes, but I know he says even the the sinners do that. The atheists are good people. They just don't believe in God. Matter of fact, you will find in some cases, some atheists will go above and beyond for homeless people more so than Christian people will. Some of the, not all, (laughs) there are some very large organizations that do a lot of work for homeless, abused people, uh, victims of sexual assault that have no basis in faith and are led by people who are faithless, but they are driven to do good. So then you answer the question for that in that context, is good, does good count for something? You gotta see, if you lead an organization that takes care of battered women, helps them hide from abusers, uh, get their strength and get their lives back together, but you do not believe in God, does that count for something on the day of judgment? Well, no. Yep. But I mean, if you do, if you believe in God and you do good, that's what ah, I mean. See, so here's that. Thank you very much there, cuz. Mm-hmm. If you believe in God, mm-hmm. then righteousness is the goal, not good. Okay. See, that was that's going to actually a sermon I'm preparing. I'm still uh, working and developing is good ain't good enough. <laughs> and when we settle for good, we are we are falling below the mark. If we set the mark here as good, there is a whole lot more to get up to righteous. Good ain't good enough because there are a lot of good people, but there are also a lot of good people who don't believe in God. That's the reason why God, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So you be good all you want. But if you don't believe in Jesus, you ain't getting to the Father. But if you believe in Jesus, the calling is greater than good. That would be, how does that gospel song go? That God has, he's been better than good? If he has been better than good to us, then we got to be better than good as well. We we always want the best and give the least. The time of indignation. Let's let's continue. Uh, The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Medea and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four horns that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall rise out of that nation, but not with its power. So historically, we can get into a whole lot of stuff where uh, theologians have already determined who these horns represent in history. And it makes sense for those theologians because that's what existed at the time. Uh, But we don't know how Daniel's vision actually works. We don't know how this vision actually translates to us in the 21st century. Are these four kingdoms past? Are they here or are they coming? I think the, the fact that if we put too much into it and say that this has already happened, that this one of the horns was Alexander the Great and some other one was from this empire and the third one was from this other empire and the fourth one was from that empire, then we're excluding anything that could potentially happen in the future or could be occurring right now. Because right now you could literally say, uh, well, we got the United States, we got China, we got Russia, and then we could name Iran as that fourth uh, power or, you know, whatever, how it works out. I mean, there's, there are different things of how people can view this thing, but we do know that right now uh, at North Korea, we got a nut job. In Russia, we got a nut job. In Iran, there's a nut job. and the United States, there's a nut job. 
And that seems to be the correlation of all these people from our time, from history and leaders of all these nations, they all have a particular common thread. They're nuts. Fearful men who abuse their power. But he says, uh, out of these four kingdoms that arise, but not with the power of that original kingdom. Verse 23, and in the later time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall rise having fierce features who understand sinister schemes. In the later time, when their transgressions have reached their fullness. Now, if we simply apply this to the days in which we are living right now, there are a lot of people who talk about that our transgressions have probably reached their fullness, that God is looking down on earth and is like, enough, I had enough with these people. Because when you start thinking about it, what more could we do? I mean, we literally, we have, um, all right, I'm about to say something, uh, and I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way, but I'm going to say it anyway. So uh, first, I'm going to qualify it by saying, no, I'm not going to qualify anything. I'm just going to say it. We live in a time that we do not protect our children or women. We also have a time of which we have made abortion the law of the land. Now, the qualification, just what I said, we do not protect our women and our children and allow them to be abused by men in power. And then now we have abortion that we have legal. We literally have sanctioned, state-sanctioned murder in the streets by our law enforcement. Uh, we have, uh, we got churches that have put leaders in place of, uh, in charge of children's ministries that are sexual deviants. We have an entire denomination of folks that have protected for decades pedophile leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much more indignation are we capable of as human beings in the face of God? Probably lots. I mean, that's it, it. I'm sure if you if you really sit back and think about it. But I mean, right now, I mean, there there's untold stuff going on every time they take down somebody for pet uh, uh, not for child pornography. I keep putting in my mind how are people capable of sexually exploiting babies? Yep. I cannot fathom that. Mm -hmm. And I cannot fathom anybody who gets any kind of arousal from that. Mm -hmm. We had Harvey Weinstein, who has been a known sexual predator, for years existed untouched. This Jeffrey Epstein, who has been known for years as a sexual predator, was allowed to roam this planet without any restriction whatsoever and having other people in his employ recruiting and bringing young girls to that man, including our current president, our past president, and world-renowned legal scholars. I don't know if you saw the interview with Alan Dershowitz, who, who, who was a, a dyed-in-the-blood true blue liberal who defends our current president because he was at Jeffrey Epstein's uh, house having a massage by a young girl to which he said he kept his underwear on. <laughs> Why he's not under a jail right now? See, this is what it's the, the, the only thing that I can think to get worse is if they actually just start killing children in the street. He said, in the latter time, when the transgressions have reached their fullness, a king shall rise, having fierce features who understands their sinister schemes. I just told you, this man, the current president, partied with Jeffrey Epstein. 
he understands the sinister schemes. Again, this, I'm not labeling him the person, I'm just drawing the similarity here. This, he's just one person because Bill Clinton has hung out with uh, Epstein. I mean, Bill's gone, he, we're not dealing with him anymore, but this is what we're, we're looking at. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. People are out of work, losing their homes, foreclosures going, people being evicted from homes. And he's standing up, uh, sitting at his desk or his daughter's posing with uh, uh, Goya products. He's got it sitting at his desk with them surrounded, just with his big goofy smile. He's making money hand over fist and this economy is tanking into the toilet. He thou shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. So he hasn't done any of that yet, but we still got time for November. We'll see how this plays out. But you see, this is what God is dealing with. This is what God is seeing here. No wonder he's talking about the, these indignation. And it's not just the, it's not a matter of the fact that you do it. We have allowed it. When do Christians take a stand and say no more? But how do we, how, when you say no more, how do we stop it? Well, I'll tell I mean, you it's this. Just, it's just, it seems like the Christians are just a grain of salt. I mean, yeah, a grain of sand or salt, whatever, in this world today. Well, everything starts with, rem remember the sermon, uh, the power of light. Mm -hmm. See, that one match. Yeah. Lights another match and another match and a lot of another match. And eventually we have not just a couple of matches burning. We got an entire fire going. We have an inferno, a raging inferno. But see, the problem, nobody wants to take the first step because when exactly. somebody comes out and speaks up on behalf of God, we label them crazy. Mm -hmm. They're crazy. And <laughs> we don't want to have any parts of that. Now, I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say, I've done that too. But it's not because I believe these people are right. I believe they are crazy because when I look at them, at me and Sean have these conversations all the time. And I first thing I do is grab my Bible. See, I take it to the text and I measure what the word of God says to the rhetoric you're speaking. And if your rhetoric does not match or line up with what God says, then you're not the one. Um, you, you got no support from me. But the problem that we have is that as believers, we don't, we have not stood up. We, we, we don't have the, the most prominent voice right now in the black community. Uh, and I hate to look, label these people as community leaders because I, I, I detest that term and I actually detest these people. We got Louis Farrakhan and Al Sharpton. They're always talking to them. Mm -hmm. <sighs> And, and I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying, you don't line up with my faith. And now there's a risk to that. And there are a lot of people that are just not willing to take that risk. And there is absolutely no way that if you call yourself a believer, that you will vote for man who is uh, um, knowingly uh, a liar, a knowing uh, criminal, a knowing person who def has defrauded countless people that has constantly been sued. He, he lied from the beginning and he's still lying. And, and it reminds me of that scripture where Jesus talked about your father, the devil's a liar from the beginning. This dude has lied from the beginning and who are his biggest defenders? Christians. And then but when you have- how do you, know that, how do you know his biggest defenders are Christians though? Yeah, because Billy Graham, not Billy Graham, what's Billy Graham's son's name? Okay, but I Franklin. mean, are they Christians or professing, professing to be Christians? Well, I can only take them for their word. Okay. So, but we see here, he said he will prosper, he is pro pro shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Then verse 25, through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. <laughs> That's gracious. 
and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. That's the good news. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> he will be broken. But I mean, but when you think about this, when you see this in verse 25, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. We actually have people, we, when prior to 2016, did anybody ever hear the term alternative facts? It's either a fact or fiction. There is no alternative facts. It's the truth or a lie. He shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. And if it's not alternative facts, it's fake news. <laughs> These are the type of things we have to be aware of as believers. And it's not just for that, for people like him. It's also for the people we come into contact with on a daily, a daily basis. The people we, maybe even some people we have known and loved our entire lives. Using deceit to prosper under their relationship with you. You know, the, I, I said this on Sunday. When, uh, when I forged my mom's name on his test, I had, been, I had forged it several times, but I kind of got cocky because I had gotten away with it. I've, when I forged her name before, I had gotten, you remember, you used to get your, your report card and your parents had to sign it and you get your, the teacher would hold it and they send it the next quarter you get it and your parents have to sign it. So I had all my old report cards. I had copies of their signature and I sit there and I put the, the, the report card under that little piece of paper and, and I would trace it and practice. I mean, I'm tracing it, spend a half hour in there tracing it to make sure it looked just like it did on the, on the report card. And I got the test and I'm tracing it and doing it, spending the time and make sure I'm doing it right, not push, pressing too hard, not skipping. And then I, I would do that. I probably did this five or six times. Ooh, Prospering you know the seat. <laughs> and then I got sloppy thinking, okay, well, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm good at it. And I did it That's and I got busted. That's funny. Which I deserve to be busted. <laughs> you did. Did you know that, Carol? Yes. That he did it five times? Oh, I didn't know how many times he had done it, but I, I knew that time that wasn't my signature. Oh, my gosh. He tried hard to convince me, but I knew better. He told it was probably more than six times, too. But, but you know, that's... Oh, that's my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that's silky. <laughs> but you see, what if pe we have people in our lives that are going to use deceit. They are going to use cunning to sit here and do things to make you believe and behave a certain way when we just are willing to let it go because, you know, well, I love her. I love him. Uh, I, I can't ignore this. Yeah, you can. I do, but, I, I, you know, I can't turn my back. Yeah, you can. You stand up for this stuff. I mean, see, here's the thing. You ask that question when, you know, what, how can we stand up? See, if you're not standing up at home, you're never going to stand up in public. If we have people in our lives, in our personal lives, that are, are acting and behaving in this fashion, uh, using us, lying to us, using deceit to, to uh, get us to behave in a certain way, if we can't stop them at home, you're never going to stand up to anybody in, out, outside of your home. When people have come into our lives, whether we are born into the family or whether we allow people in and we allow them to practice like we see or use the same uh, type of, of action as we see here in verse 25, we are never going to get past that. We are, are actually participating in this same stuff. The, the transgressions will reach their fullness and we have helped contribute to it. Verse 26, and the vision of the evenings and the mornings, which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, and it refers <clears throat> to many days in the future, 
and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Even after he had the explanation from, from Gabriel, he still didn't understand it. And you, you see, it bothered him so, as he said, he was, <laughs> I fainted and I was sick for days. He couldn't get up, couldn't function, couldn't go to work because this dream had troubled him so. Even after Gabriel told him, this is not happening now, this is for the later days. But here, Daniel is one who had a heart for the people. He obviously loved God, and he doesn't want to see this type of stuff happen. You know, he doesn't want to see the transgressions reach their fullness. He doesn't want to look at the end times as the time of indignation. But, you know, we as believers, we just sit back and allow it to happen, and we just accept it. Well, then, you know, I, I can't do nothing. Uh, what, what am I supposed to do? I'm only one person. You're one person with the mighty God behind you. None of this might even refer to a leader, but just us. This body of believers was rising up in us when we fall and when one horn breaks and another one rises. What's, what's rising up? What are we even growing in the first place? Is it of God or is it just our carnal desire to please ourselves and and fill up on everything we want of the world and not of what God has for us. See, sometimes I think that that old saying, you can't see the forest for the trees. As a child, I didn't understand that, but I, as I, I age and I get more uh, uh, older and more mature, hopefully gaining more wisdom, I'm starting to see how some of this stuff plays out. And even in the body of faith that we can't even see what's in front of us for religion. You can't see righteousness for religion. And that might be the biggest problem that God has with us. We're too doggone stuck in religion. You talk to this person this is how church is supposed to be. Talk to another person. This is how church is supposed to be. Y'all don't know nothing, neither one. If you can't reach the person, then you've all been doing it wrong. We've all been doing it wrong. The point is to reach somebody. And if we are turning away more people than we reach, you're doing it wrong. And you think about this ram and the goat and look at the ram and the goat as church folk and everybody coming against church folk get demolished and trampled, which is what we do. Somebody posted a picture on my timeline of a woman wearing some skin tight outfit and said, is this appropriate for church? As it's not something that I would wear, obviously, because it was women's clothes, but I'm not going to turn away a woman from my church who was dressed like she's going to the club because she's dressed like she's going to the club. But yet we have churches that will tell you, you can't come in here dressed like that. How are they supposed to experience God if we are knocking them away? Every time they approach from the east, we're knocking them. From the west, we're knocking Everywhere they approach, they come from, the ram knocks them back and none can stand in its way till the goat comes. And here's the bigger church, the bigger denomination, telling folks how they're supposed to behave, how you're supposed to dress, what's appropriate when you come into church. This is how we sing. This is how we pray. This is how you're supposed to worship God. You can't come in here smelling like alcohol. Heaven forbid somebody gay wants to come and worship Lord. Now I know that my mind doesn't work like everybody else's, but as much as I can see this pertaining to specific leaders, I also see it pertaining to specific Christians. I see it pertaining to me and the biases that exist in me 
that I have to catch myself when I find myself ready to judge somebody because they're doing something different from what I do. What if I'm that ram? What if you're the goat? What does that mean for the rest of us? That we are so hung up on ourselves. I mean, think about this. We, we know even our little church, even as, as welcoming as we like to be, we know that there are some that no, 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 nope, you can't do that. How many times has my mother told me I can't come and preach in short pants? Every time I see them. <laughs> But here's the reality. Do you think God really cares if I wear shorts or not? Who, who really, and, and let's, as we, we're not going to go to nine today because we only have seven minutes left. But in, in a real sense, let, let's think about this here. What are the things that we want to see in church? Or no, what are the things we don't want to see in church? You don't want to see in mm -hmm. church. I, I'll start off. It, people don't want to see gay uh, men and women in church. They don't. I think about we as we individual like us on here, because I don't think it bothers us. Oh, but, we, but we know we know how church folk are, because we all, all of us that I know of personally, the people who I know personally on here, uh, mm -hmm. are church folk from from mm -hmm. birth practically. And we know how those people think because we were part of that group, still part of that group. We don't want to see no gay people in church. We don't want to see no single mothers, no pregnant teens. Hmm. We just don't want to see it because it's just, it's, it's just, well, I, I wouldn't want to see the um the gay part doesn't bother me but i wouldn't want to see a pregnant teen i mean not i wouldn't want to it's just it's just sad that this world has come to that you know but where see, everything yeah, the world has of, been that so see that's the remember years ago when um probably during my mom's time if if a teenager got pregnant what do they do send her away well, yeah, because uh, I remember when I was in um, high school or whatever, they did the same thing. But I'm just saying, it's just so, it's just everywhere today. So it doesn't bother you, bother me per se in that sense. It just bothers me that the world has come to that point where everything is so acceptable. That's what bothers me. Well, see, here's the thing the reason why some of this behavior is acceptable because we haven't given them an alternative. And see, I've, I have said it uh, openly. There are some people that when I was, when I was out of church mm -hmm. and the thought of going back to church meant that I was going to have to be around Christian people. Mm -hmm. No, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't want what they got. So it's very easy to look at the book of Daniel and say, this is really all about these leaders. And it very, very well can be because Gabriel talked about these kingdoms specifically. But when we look at the Bible and how we typically read it and how we typically interpret the metaphors, it is not always about specific leaders. As a matter of fact, what we do know when we read the Bible is that the Bible is generally not just talking about the, hold on, let me grab my Bible. My Bible here, I'm holding it right, unlike other people, because I know what I'm <laughs> uh, But my Bible here, when I read this, this is for me. Mm -hmm. And when I read it, I believe God is talking to me. So when most of us are reading it, that is typically how we, we read it as well, that he is, talking to me that when 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 we see John 3 16 he says for God so loved the world it means 
I'm part of that world, that God loved me so much that he did this for me. We, we know the story, the parable, when Jesus left the, nine, the flock of 99 sheep to go after the one, that this is a story of coming for the one, and that one is me. So if everything in this book is about me and my relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, why then would Daniel be the only book that's about a leader or a kingdom and not me? I'm just providing a different way of looking at alternative view, if you will. <laughs> that if, if this whole thing is a personal love letter to Ronald Thomas, then Daniel would be part of that love letter to me. I mean, can you imagine when, when, when we were young and uh, you got your first love letter, whether it was your boyfriend or girlfriend, they didn't write you the letter and then start talking about uh, your job. It was all about you and that person and how much they love you and how much they can't wait to see you and how much they miss you. This book is all about God's love to us and for us. And I would think that Daniel as well, that he didn't just start writing this thing and give me all this stuff to tell me about how he loves me and what he's doing for me and giving me laws and guidance on things that I can follow to make sure I live a holy and righteous life. Then just to all of a sudden start talking about the world, unless it is about me. That's, that's just the way I look at it. Again, I know I'm weird. I admit that I am weird with some stuff and I am weird when it comes to about this understanding of this book, but I would defy anybody to come and give me evidence and say, Prove to me that this is not necessarily about us as individuals and how we make the other people who are around us feel about our faith. I mean, I know I'm not the only one who was, who was turned away from church by church people. Mm -hmm. There's a whole ministry that exists on healing people on church hurt. How to deal with church hurt because people hurt, Christians hurt those who don't think like them. Christians are some of the most unforgiving. Not all, somebody will be told, oh, I'm not like that. I'm not saying you're like that. As a general rule, Christians are some of the most hardest people to please, the most unforgiving, clearly the most judgmental, and definitely will we'll, uh, uh, nail you to the cross faster than they nailed Jesus. Then turn around and lie about it. Or blame you. Well, if you hadn't done that, then I wouldn't have had to do this. My mom used to always say, I'd rather see a sermon than hear a sermon. And the problem, too many of us want to preach, but we don't want to live what we preach. That's just my two cents. Again, this is not, this is not a lot. This is only for, for your consideration to think when you have your quiet time and you're reading and studying the Bible and, and begin to look at some of these things and say, you know what? He might be on to something, but it's okay to say, no, he's way off base. He's, he's a nut. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. And y'all know you talk like that, so. <laughs> I'm washing his mouth out with soap, Chantel. Uh-oh. <laughs> don't, get, don't get her started. She's not sitting on the couch next to me, so I can't. That's part of probably why I'm not talking about her, because I'm not looking at her rolling her eyes at me. <laughs> <laughs> she's online, but she's down in the room. Uh, mm. So we're going to be uh, in uh, Daniel uh, 10 next week, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very, very powerful prayer uh, that Daniel prays for Israel. Uh, and uh, I, I would encourage you to read it beforehand uh, because there's a, a lot of good stuff in there. We might have to spend two weeks on, on 10 alone. Uh, but, you know, do your due diligence, read 10. We're almost done with Daniel, which is a good thing. It's just uh, chapter 10, chapter 11, and chapter 12. And then we are done with Daniel uh, for now, because you never know when you might end up having to go back uh, to it for whatever reason. But uh, 
uh, that's that would be what I would encourage you to uh, uh, to look. Sherelle, you were quiet tonight. What do you have to say? Um, nothing. I'm just trying to take it all in. It's a it's a lot of good points. Um, like I said, a lot of it I I get and I understand, but um, I'm not I'm not really big on following politics. So a lot of times I don't know all of the correlations. Oh, oh, okay. From that aspect of it, um, I know some of it, but just not a lot of it, and I don't never been one to to follow it. So I, I, I mean, but outside of that, it's it's been a very good and interesting study to me. Um, I'm I, I like how you have pointed out the reality of it to help you understand it a lot better. So I'm just looking forward to finish it, but I was. Question, you said we're starting at 10. What about nine? Didn't we just finish eight? No, that was nine. Wasn't it nine? That was, you were on eight, but we were supposed to be nine because you said last week that oh, we didn't. I'm sorry. Anybody. That's what it, yeah. Okay. So the prayer. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I misspoke. Thank you for catching that, Shira. We were eight. So chap, uh, Daniel chapter nine is what we'll be doing next week. Okay. Right. I was off base. So we're going to be uh, chapter nine, probably two weeks in nine. So it's nine. 10, 11, and 12. So uh, that's it. Yeah. So it's, uh, we were in chapter eight. We'll be in chapter nine next week. Thank you, Sherelle, for bringing that up. <laughs> Why did Daniel get sick? What, because, because he, he, he didn't know what, what the end results were? Well, it's, it's kind of distressing. I mean, if you, you have a, a clear vision like that, and I remember when I shared about um, me having a nightmare with when my daughter Alex was a baby, yeah. and how it woke me up and how upset I was that I had to get up. I woke up in tears and had to run to her room to make sure she was okay and held her until it was time for me to get up and go to work because I didn't want to let her go. Uh, so he's not just, you know, having a dream to that degree. He's having a dream that's looking at the end of the world, at the end times, the destruction uh, of mankind. And that would make that as I wasn't sick from my dream about Alex, but I tell you what, it, it, uh, I was certainly distressed. Uh, and that's probably what added to my rage with the COVID because I was remembering this little baby I was holding in my arms. Uh, but uh, yeah, that dream that he had, it, it's, I would imagine that it just made him sick uh, to vision, to have that vision and, and not understand it and even be in the presence of, of an angel and have the angel explain it to you and you still, uh, uh, you know, so, but that's just my observation. That's not necessarily the truth. It, you know, we don't know. It just said that Daniel was sick. So. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'm, uh, this was uh, very enlightening. Um, does anybody want to pray us out to stretch their faith muscles? I will. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight right now and close another study. Lord, we just thank you for all the information that was provided for us. There was food for thought, wisdom for the soul, and something to ponder as we evaluate ourselves and to become closer and a better person uh, for you, to represent you, Lord. We just ask that as we leave this place or from this study in this group, that everyone is still healthy, stay healthy and protected um, until we can meet again. We ask all these things and more in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you, Shirelli Rell. And happy Amen. anniversary. It's uh, her and Tony celebrated their uh, eighth anniversary. Yeah. Eighth hey. anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Guys. Happy anniversary, guys. Yeah. All right. So I will uh, uh, sign out and I will check.